Welcome, and I'm delighted that you've joined us to learn a little bit more about disease modeling and how engineers have been uh, participating in this and continue to participate in this. Uh, we are recording this session for the future. Um, I would also encourage you to submit any questions that you have using the chat box. Um, we will take them uh, at a couple of points during the seminar and also have some time at the end for that. So I'm Julie Swan, and this is the FITS Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at NC State University, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you here today. So let's talk a little bit about disease modeling and the, the basis uh, on which a lot of the models are built. And uh, there's a name of a model called an SEIR, and so we're going to step through that. Uh, S is for susceptible. So this part of the model is looking at an individual in the population. An individual begins as, as healthy, but they are susceptible to uh, an infectious disease. They may become exposed uh, at some point in time. Uh, let's say someone in their household is sick and they uh, breathe the same air or uh, get, get caught in a, a cough. After a period of time that someone is exposed, uh, that person can become infectious to others. And then hopefully they recover, of course. And so that's where the acronym SEIR uh, arises. Now for different diseases, of course, there is a different amount of time that you spend in each one of these different states. Uh, and for COVID or specifically the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID disease, um, you spend about 14 days in this uh, time period between infectious and recovered and the time period between exposed but infectious could be three to five days, uh, depending on which estimates you use. But the actual model that a lot of the disease models are, are built upon are a little bit more complicated than the one that I'm showing you on this screen. I want to go a little bit deeper and see some of the other things that come into play. Uh, now, before I do that, I want to talk about a, another definition that is useful as we hear about not only COVID-19, but also influenza or other types of viruses. And, and that is how the virus is measured in terms of its infectivity. So the most important measure of the infectivity is called R0, or the reproductive rate. And it's an imperfect measure, um, but the way that it's generally defined is that at the beginning of a virus outbreak, it's the average number of people infected by someone during their infectious period. So this is without interventions in place. And so you can of course see that as interventions are in place, the effective R0 can change over time, or as there are people in the community that may have um, uh, immunity to a particular virus. Now a related measure to the R0 that you sometimes hear about in the news is the doubling rate of cases. And again, that would be directly related with R0 uh, and would be a particular value at the beginning of an outbreak, but could change at different points in time. The R0 for COVID-19 uh, is thought to be between two and three. So that means that uh, someone who is infectious would infect on average two to three other people. Uh, so this makes the virus more infectious than influenza, but less infectious than measles. And so, so this, this is, again, that typical value. Now, sometimes I actually like to think of an R0 that may be specific to a community, like the R0 for New York City may be different than the R0 for Raleigh. Or you can even have the R0 for a particular individual based on the activities that that individual is uh, undertaking may be different than another individual. So as I mentioned, the, the model itself is a little bit more complicated than what I showed you. And in fact, what you, what you have is that you take the infectious period and you actually um, have different situations that can arise. So you could have someone that doesn't have symptoms at all ever. And so we call that person asymptomatic. And for COVID-19, it does look like there are uh, a percentage of people who either have very mild cases or do not have symptoms at all. You also have people who eventually have symptoms but don't have symptoms at the beginning when they are actually infectious to others. And of course, you, you have some people who are hospitalized. Uh, 
And so this picture here is showing the fact that an individual may transition through different states and eventually uh, recovery, although of course in some of the more severe cases the, there may be deaths that occur. The transition rates in this that would be uh, at the back of this picture here can differ by age. Uh, and of course, one important factor is the mortality rates, which I want to talk about a little bit more. So there are two different kinds of measures that you may hear about in the news if you hear about mortality or fatality. And um, one of them relates to, of the people who are exposed to the disease, how many people will eventually die? But that's really hard to capture because there are people who may be asymptomatic or they may have had mild symptoms, but they weren't tested. So you have, it's difficult to understand the true number of people who were exposed to the disease. What's more commonly known is the number who were symptomatic and symptomatic most um, who had enough symptoms so that they had to be hospitalized. So this red circle here is indicating known cases of the disease. And so here we can look at the fatality rate of this group of people more easily than we can look at the fatality rate of these people who were exposed to the disease. And so that's why we'll get different estimates that I'll tell you about in the next slide. So the case fatality rate is divided by the number of diagnosed or confirmed cases, whereas the infection fatality rate is divided by the total number of cases, which includes mild and asymptomatic cases as well. Now this is a picture here from a website, Our World in Data, and you can see that this is the case fatality rate. So this is of the known cases. And uh, you can see that Italy has here, uh, this is over time on the bottom, and that the case fatality rate has, has leveled off, but is, but is pretty high. Uh, you can compare that to Germany. You can see that there's a lower case fatality rate, and there could be a couple of different reasons for that. Italy has an older population, so that might come into it. But also Italy went through time periods where the hospital systems were overwhelmed and so they were not able to provide sufficient care to everyone who was sick at, at some points in time. So that can also uh, add to uh, the, the differences in the case fatality rate. Now look here at, at South Korea and even Iceland. So why is, is the case fatality rate really different in all of these places? Not necessarily. But it is possible that some of this is driven by the number of diagnosed or confirmed cases. And we know that Germany, South Korea, and Iceland have been doing a substantial amount of testing. And so in those countries, the case fatality rate is closer to this true infection fatality rate. And so my current estimate for the true mortality is somewhere between 0.5 and 1%. That's consistent with this uh, Iceland example right here and is consistent with what other researchers have found. But the number that you more often see in the news is something more like 3% or even the 12% of Italy. But you just have to be careful because that has a, a different denominator on it. Now, going back to that uh, transition model, you can have different rates. They might be age specific. So we know that for COVID-19, the risks tend to increase with age. So here, this picture is, is from a paper about uh, rates in China. And you can see that these are uh, the, the, the mortality of the confirmed cases and of all infections. And you can see here that this rate based on age is going up over time. So it's not that young people don't get the disease at all, but they may have milder symptoms and so they may not be tested or may not show up, um, but uh, the severe outcome rate is lower. There are also comorbidities that may uh, change someone's individual likelihood of a severe outcome. And there may also be relationships with other things like what occupation someone has and whether they're getting a high viral load like a healthcare worker. Um, we are also seeing that fatality rates uh, among African Americans and Hispanics have been really high. It's not entirely clear what's driving that, but probably a combination of different factors um, that uh, need to be accounted for because that's really putting a high burden on those communities. Now, going back to this reproductive rate, um, the reproductive rate relates very closely to herd immunity. So herd immunity is what you hear talked about in the media sometimes, where if 
if there's enough people in a community who have already have immunity to a disease, then that can stop the outbreak from progressing. And so if you think about the case of vaccinations, uh, when you get, let's say, over 90% of people have um, immunity to a particular disease, then that can make, uh, that can protect other people who don't have the vaccine. For measles, that value is very high. Uh, for others, it's a little bit lower. And in fact, it's directly related to the reproductive rate. So let's look at it with a couple of examples. Herd immunity is often uh, depicted drawing cows, and I, I made some pictures of a, a numerical example that's given in the resource down at the bottom uh, that I thought was a great way of describing it. So imagine that a mosquito has a communicable disease, and during the infectious period, it has time to infect two cows. So that's a reproductive rate of 2.0. Now, if this mosquito is randomly choosing cows from the herd, if 50% of the cows are immune, then this mosquito will not be able to, uh, it would not lead to a growth in the, uh, the virus epidemic in that, in that population uh, because it, just, it can just re reproduce itself but not uh, lead to a larger number of viruses over time uh, circulating in that herd. Let's look at a, a, a big R0, a value of 5.0. So that's uh, more infectious than COVID-19, but less infectious than measles. So during the infectious period, it means the mosquito has time to infect five cows. If the mosquito is randomly choosing cows, if four of those are protected, shown here in the darker shading, then the mosquito will not be able to transmit the virus and grow the epidemic. It might transmit the virus, but it wouldn't grow the epidemic. So you can see for this example with an R0 of 2, the herd immunity is achieved if at least 50% of the cows have immunity. But for an R0 of 5, you need at least 80% of the cows to have herd immunity. Now COVID-19 is thought to be between a, a value of 2 and 3 for the reproductive rate. And if that is true, then we can calculate that herd immunity could be achieved somewhere between 50% and two thirds or 67%. Or so this means that in the absence of vaccines uh, or other kinds of things, we have to have a significant portion of the population with immunity. Now let's go back uh, to this picture for a moment. At the various, very simplest, it's an SEIR model. Um, this, is, uh, this has mathematical equations at the back of it. So it's using differential equations. The, uh, the standard model would be a deterministic one. It's also called a compartmental model. But right now, this is taking either an individual or an entire population as a group. But what about other people? What about a community or a network of people? In fact, that's what we do in a lot of our disease modeling. So here's a picture. Here's a, a picture of a community. And we've got individuals that are living in households of different sizes, perhaps of different ages. Uh, some of the households have children, some of them do not, and we can characterize these uh, according to uh, whatever the values might be in the, the a particular community of interest. And just as a reminder, if, if you don't have it done already, I would encourage everyone to mute yourselves during this part of the webinar, and we'll have time later uh, for a question and answer. Now, these households don't exist in isolation, of course, and they have things that they need to do during the day. Uh, in fact, we'll add into this that children may be going to school. So some of these households would end up mixing through that school environment. We also have uh, adults who may be going to work. And so we have adults who may be mixing in those workplace environments. And finally, we have the community itself where there may be interactions at the grocery store or church or uh, playground or other kinds of activities. Now, this is the kind of model that, that I have uh, done the most work with. And you can take this framework and build it into a computer simulation where you take an initial person who's infected or perhaps more than one person who's infected, and then you model the different interactions that someone would have throughout the, the day and the night over some longer period of time. There's a great graphic that came out of the Washington Post about this showing little dots moving uh, all across the screen. Um, and I can provide that resource later if anyone is interested in seeing it. <clears throat> 
But this picture also can suggest some of the community uh, interventions that can help slow down a disease outbreak. So for one thing, if you have someone who's been identified as being sick, then they can quarantine at home. And you can also ask their household members to isolate uh, in that home environment because it is likely that they could uh, be infected by their household member since that is where the majority of, um, uh, that's uh, the, the single largest cause of infections. So if everyone were to be able to identify a disease quickly and self-quarantine, then this would be a great strategy. Of course, it's a little more difficult when the case uh, may be asymptomatic. And so that is one of the things that makes COVID-19 difficult. You can close the schools so that children are not interacting in the school environment, but rather are staying in the households. We've certainly seen that during the COVID-19 outbreak. We had a little bit of that during the H1N1 pandemic, but not as much as we've seen during COVID. You can have people telecommute so that they're not interacting in those workplace environments. Again, keeping uh, the mixing separate so that different groups are not interacting as much. And you have other kinds of things like community where, the, where you look at your sports activities, your places of worship, your uh, non-essential businesses, things like that. Uh, and then you also have things like personal protection, protective equipment and other non-pharmaceutical interventions that can be put in place. And so this can uh, have an impact throughout these different kinds of environments. Now, in a simulation, of course, you can test out different things. Uh, you need some information about what the impact is uh, of wearing a, a covering or not wearing it. And you need some idea of what the level of transmission is in, in different environments like households, schools, and workplaces. Uh, but there has been evidence built up on that, um, in particular for, for influenza that is useful for COVID-19 as well. So that basic SEIR model, we have built it into an agent-based simulation, where here the agents are these individuals moving across the network and interacting. It is a complex system. It is stochastic. Uh, we have random interactions that are occurring each day, but it does allow us to study different kinds of interventions and in what-if scenarios. Now, like all simulations, we have to validate our model and make sure that it's a, a good representation, uh, but there are a number of different techniques uh, to be used for that. There are other approaches. There's the simpler deterministic SEIR model uh, that's built on differential equations. I've provided a link to one calculator there and you can, you can try one out yourself and, and play with different values. Um, there's another model that has uh, gotten a lot of attention this year that has come out of uh, Washington uh, by the IMHE group. And that one is a different kind of model. It's not directly an SEIR model or a simulation, but rather they've taken the patterns for what was happening in other countries like China and tried to adapt that to the United States. And so I think that particularly played an important role early on but it becomes harder to use that one when you don't have as many different examples that match very directly with what's going on in the United States. And there are a variety of these models um, uh, in, from different universities and even some companies uh, looking at COVID-19 as well as having been used for many different diseases over a period of many years. Now, when you have a, a model uh, uh, forecast, you know, there, there are several different things that I look at uh, in that model. So uh, we would look at cases. We'd look at cases that are new per day. And so that's called incidents. We look at cumulative cases. Uh, so if it's the cumulative true cases, we look, we call that the infection attack rate. But if it's the just the cases showing symptoms, then we call that the clinical attack rate. We look at hospitalizations and deaths, of course. Um, as engineers, we think a lot about uh, capacity and planning and supply and demand. So that also leads us to look at the surge uh, and what might happen during the time period of the peak of infectivity and what resources might be available. There's also the, um, the length of the outbreak itself and how long a community might need to be prepared to respond. And then there may be critical resources that may be uh, like hospital beds or ICU beds or healthcare workers or ventilators or other kinds of things that can be estimated from a model.
Now, some people may want to think about what kinds of factors impact the spread of a disease. So why have we seen so many cases in Italy or in New York City? So there are a number of different uh, factors and different categories of factors that can affect disease spread. One relates to the disease itself. So, uh, in, so in this, we have the infectivity of the disease, which one way of representing that is through the R0 value. As I mentioned, COVID-19 is more infectious than the average influenza virus. Then there's the time period that individuals may be asymptomatic. That does seem to be higher for COVID than it is for some diseases, which makes it harder to uh, catch cases early and prevent infections. There's the duration of a disease. You know, you can think of um, influenza and coronaviruses as having a very different duration than hepatitis viruses, for example, where the latter could be dormant for years and years before activating. There's the possibility of severe outcomes, uh, such as hospitalizations and death. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, is not the, the most severe of the coronaviruses. There are ones with far higher mortality, but it does have a combination of a high infectivity and a high mortality rate that's about five to 10 times that of, of normal flu. You also can have super spreaders who just seem to shed more virus than, than other people do. Uh, and so there are some, some cases where you've seen one particular individual, rather than infecting the average two or three, they've actually infected 50 or 70 or more cases during the time period that they were infectious. And this could be a combination of the business that they're in, their personal patterns, like whether they shake hands and, and hug a lot, uh, as well as the disease itself and, and how easily it sheds from them. Uh, they do think for COVID-19 that about 20% of the people are much more infectious to others than the others, but we don't know who those are, so we have to really uh, uh, deal with everyone who might be infectious. Then there are the transmission pathways. Does it transmit through air or water or other methods? We know for the COVID-19, uh, for the virus that causes it, there is a respiratory component and it can be in air. There is some evidence that it can survive on surfaces for a somewhat short period of time. And there's also a potential fecal route because of the, the symptom associated with diarrhea. And so that is also true of uh, the previous SARS virus where there was uh, plumbing and HVAC systems that were involved in some transmission of cases. The most common does seem to be the respiratory, uh, but it's good to be aware of those other potential pathways as well. Now, in addition to the actual disease factors that impact the spread, there are also the factors that relate to the community itself. So I, I think of you know, New York City versus Raleigh versus Hickory, North Carolina, which are, are quite different. So why are they different? Well, certainly the density is different uh, in New York City. And so that's going to mean a larger number of people at the grocery store, a larger number of people that you pass in the street or when you're jogging. Um, and so those contacts between people. There's the factor of transportation itself, which in New York City includes public transport. So anything where you have a lot of people gathering and you're mixing people from all different households and you have the potential not only for, for breathing that air, but also the, the surfaces that you might be touching. But there's also travel between cities. That travel between cities can be through airports. So typically cities with airports are going to uh, have a disease uh, come there earlier and spread faster because of the, the contact patterns. But there's also uh, commuting that occurs by car or other ways. And so in our agent-based simulation, we do account for the commuting that can occur both for work reasons or for other reasons within, between or among communities within a state the contacts between or among people. So here I think of an example where Italy may be a society where people are uh, closer than they are in some societies. You know, they may hug more or uh, kiss on the cheek more. And so that might also mean a different um, effective R0 in that community compared to some others. And then you have things like mass gatherings. One example of this is Mardi Gras, where there were lots of people who came in and then dispersed back to their uh, locations. You also saw this on the Florida beaches around the time of spring break. And I would expect that we will see more of this um, from holidays like Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and, and other kinds of things. And that can also impact the spread of a disease.
And then finally, of course, any interventions that might be in place, either individual ones and choices that individuals make or ones that are available at that city or state or federal level. And these include a number of different things like the distancing policies and, and face coverings, but also treatments. As we start to roll out more treatments, then that can reduce the mortality, that can reduce the time period people are in the hospitals and free up those critical resources. Now, the, the next set of results, um, I'm going to present some specific ones that uh, have been pulled from our model results for influenza over a, you know, about a decade time period. But if you have questions about the disease transmission itself, this would be a good time to put those into the chat box so that you don't forget them. And you can either address them to everyone, or if you wanted to address them to a particular person, Karen Welton can, uh, can help manage that process. So now I'm going to go into some specifics related to influenza, and this will help illustrate some of this agent-based modeling that I'm talking about. So we started work on this project um, before our previous pandemic. Uh, we, were, uh, we wanted to use our engineering skills to help impact public good, and we turned towards pandemic because we knew that there was a pandemic that was anticipated to come. So the model was developed, and then we had the H1N1 uh, novel influenza virus hit the world and, and specifically also hit the US in 2009. And so we took our existing influenza model and adapted it for the H1N1 specific parameters. We used this for planning and we worked with a lot of organizations and government agencies and others and uh, presented our results and tested out different scenarios. We did of course publish a number of things as well. And this model is in process of being adapted for COVID-19 disease. It has been already adapted for Georgia and, has, and is being rolled out there and is assisting with the planning. And we're now putting in the North Carolina data. But the results that I'm presenting to you today are driven by the influenza parameters, but they are ones that I think provide insights for COVID-19 as well. And here are some examples below on some of those different references that if you are interested, you can look into more later. So this is some, uh, a set of pictures that arose from this agent-based simulation. And here I'm showing you the percentage of people infected. So this is the, the classic uh, epidemiological curve that you may have seen in uh, newspaper articles. And I'm showing to you, uh, it to you for three different values of R0. So this one is a disease that had a higher R0, was more infectious. This was uh, perhaps similar to the influenza uh, virus in 1918. Uh, the second one is closer to the pandemic that occurred in 1957 and 58. And the third one is closer to the, epi uh, the pandemic that occurred in 1968. So a couple of different examples, and they all start at the same point in time, and this is time running on the bottom. This is number of days. But you can see that when there's a, an R0 that's bigger, that this peak is higher and that it occurs earlier and that the duration is shorter. So anytime you slow down that transmission rate or slow down that reproductive rate, effectively you're also stretching out that curve and it's going to last for a longer period of time, a longer duration. So you can see this in, in looking at the width of, that, of those curves. Uh, you could also see by looking at when the peak occurs. In this case, it occurs on day 40, whereas in this case here, it occurs on day 70. Now, all three of these are shown without any, any interventions in place. And in this, one of the things that I look at is what percentage of people eventually acquired the disease. So this points towards this herd immunity idea, um, and, it, and it also you know, tells us something about how long this goes on and how many people are impacted. So that value is listed here in this column called IAR, infection attack rate. So you can see in the, the smallest reproductive rate, this is about 50% of the population eventually had the disease. In the, in the biggest one, it's about 78%, so close to 80%, not, not quite there. So now this is um, uh, you know, a little bit different than the analysis you get when just looking at that, that herd because it's a more complicated system than that, a network with all kinds of interactions. But this gives you some sense of how many people eventually have the disease for different values of R0. 
And in these different cases, there was also a, a, a set of parameters related to death, and it showed the percentage of the population uh, uh, who passed away. Now, so this is useful perhaps from an aggregate level and you know you could learn some things but i'm also interested in how the disease spreads geographically over time and what might be occurring in that case so i have two different examples that i'm going to show you in one case we've introduced more seeds in this rural area of georgia which is in atkinson county and in the other case we introduced more seeds in the fulton area of georgia which is around atlanta and this is more urban and remember that these, these networks include the commuting that may occur back and forth, both to close locations and even to further away locations for each pair of locations in the state of Georgia. And you'll see this, we'll see this over time. We're going to look at some snapshots over time for influenza. So day 10, day 30, day 50, day 70, day 90. Now you can see it's decreasing. Now let's go back and just look somewhere close to the middle there. Day 50, you can hardly tell the difference at day 50 between what's occurring in that rural area here and that, that urban area in the two maps. And that is a typical kind of result. What we typically find is that areas that are very connected and very dense and have a lot of commuting to and from are going to get the disease almost no matter what, uh, and they'll get it fairly early in an epidemic, um, but you may find that rural areas could differ a little bit in when they get hit. They will get hit, uh, this doesn't show the end of the disease, um, but they get hit at a, at a different time period sometimes. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the infections per time, uh, and on the right hand side, I'm showing the same. On the left, the seed was introduced in the rural area. On the right, the seed was introduced in the urban area. And you can see that the, the blue uh, curve that corresponds to a populous county that's in Macon, Georgia, is fairly consistent from the left picture to the right picture. But there is a difference between the brown and, and purple circles and, and stars here on the left-hand picture and the right-hand picture. And that is partly driven by the fact that um, uh, the Atkinson one introduced the seed at a different point in time. And you can even see a little bit of a different change in those pink squares on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. But because we're showing absolute numbers, you can't see it as much because those numbers are pretty small. So in general, the peak infection rate, the height, tends to be similar regardless of where the virus started, but the timing of the peak could depend a little bit on when it just happened to arise in that area. Now let's look at the impact of quarantine or interventions. Uh, and, and in this specific case, the scenarios that we were testing were that when someone was sick from influenza, they would stay at home. And they would stay at home. Uh, we were looking at this scenario when we were doing this, and we knew that people wouldn't stay at home for long periods of time. And we knew that the public would not continue to have the same behaviors over the entire epidemic. So the, the picture that I'm showing you is when this voluntary quarantine is only happening for two weeks. And we're going to introduce it at different time periods after when the infection started. So here in the first chart, we're introducing that two week quarantine in week three, four, five, or six. And you can see it a little bit here on the left-hand side. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of a blip in the epidemic curve and that it kind of smooths out and continues along its path. The next slide is showing it for week six, seven, eight, and nine. And here you can see more of a difference. This, uh, the quarantine, you can see that it really changed the shape of that epidemic curve. Now, in some cases, the first peak in this green case is smaller than the second peak, while in other cases, in this light blue line here, the first peak is higher than the second peak. So it just, you know, one, one week or two difference could, could make a difference in terms of when it happened to hit in that epidemic. Now on the bottom, I have a third one showing when that two week quarantine is introduced in week nine, 10, 11, or 12. And you can see here, you're further along in the epidemic when it's introduced, 
And so in some cases, it doesn't seem to have much of an impact, uh, maybe a little bit in the case of the pink line that spreads out a little bit. Uh, but in the case of this uh, light blue line, it does where there's a higher peak first and then a lower peak. So this, this relates to how you might think about interpreting some of the data that you see, but I also think that it would be useful to put it in context of history. There was this great uh, article that I saw from National Geographic that captured some data from the 1918 curve. And so I'm showing you here some pictures of the epidemic spread or the pandemic spread for different cities in the United States. And look at the shapes of those epi curves. You can see that they're quite different. You've got Pittsburgh here, maybe a little bit uh, more similar. Philadelphia is really high and peaky, and then it, it flattens out. You've got others, Kansas City here, where it has multiple peaks. Denver over here, multiple peaks. You know, so why is that occurring? What's going on? Uh, the shading here that's provided by National Geographic is showing the time period of some of the distancing measures but there were also other things that were going on. So for example, it's been well discussed that Philadelphia allowed uh, a St. Patrick's Day parade to continue and there were 100,000 people in contact with each other and that likely led to a very quick spread of the virus in that city. Whereas I believe it's St. Louis that was known well for choosing to not have that big parade and so it would have had a very different picture. So, you know, there are all kinds of different factors in addition to those. It can be the density, the connectedness, uh, travel, mass events, all kinds of different things that might relate to that. Uh, whether you see a very smooth picture, whether you see one peak, two peaks, three peaks, et cetera. So sometimes I get asked the question, will we have a second peak of a second wave of COVID-19? So this picture from 1918 certainly suggests that it's possible, uh, may be driven by several different um, uh, reasons, and it may be different for different communities, but it certainly suggests that it's possible. We can go a little bit further, and I can tell you a little bit more about what can drive those second peaks. So in particular for influenza virus, it's known to be impacted by seasonality, specifically uh, temperature or humidity may be factors where in the Northern hemisphere, influenza slows down during the summer. We also know that viruses can mutate and that means as it mutates that people who previously had the disease no longer have immunity from it. So that can cause additional waves of disease. And we've done a number of uh, modeling things in this space, and we've determined that we can reproduce a variety of different shapes of curves. This particular one here is showing the curve that corresponds most closely to the 1918 pandemic uh, for the entire US. And you can see here, there's a little bit of, of some cases appear early on in this time period. Uh, we have the seasonality uh, specifically related to the summer in the United States, and then the, the flu came back in the fall and winter, and then a mutation occurred sometime around here during this time period, and then that left a lot of people susceptible to the disease again. So that led to a, a third peak of that particular pandemic. So it is certainly possible um, but we talk about different kinds of things. So this, this is one kind of, of second wave or peak that people talk about. Um, right now, we think that COVID-19 will not have as big uh, a relationship with seasonality as influenza does, but it is possible that it slows down some in the summertime. Right now, so far, there have not been significant mutations for COVID-19. Of course, it could occur in the future. Uh, the best science that, that I've seen on it suggests that most people will develop some level of immunity, but it will be short to medium term immunity, not a lifetime of immunity. And then of course, like we saw in this previous picture, uh, distancing policies and quarantining policies and these kinds of things can also impact where we are in this curve and whether another peak is coming in that particular area or not. Now, I want to use some uh, detail from COVID-19 just to illustrate some different ideas and talk about how to interpret some of the data that you might see uh, in the news, given what you now know about modeling. 
So I've taken a number of images from Our World in Data. It's a great website with lots of good information and it's regularly updated. I've also taken some from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as uh, the graphics from newspapers who have some really nice ones, specifically the New York Times has some really nice graphics. Uh, so this one is showing deaths and cases at the world level. So this is continuing to, to go up and it is um, thought widely that this is an undercount of the actual cases since there are a number of mild and asymptomatic cases. This one here is showing the deaths per million people uh, as of yesterday. And you can see the, the red is darker. That means more deaths per person. Um, there are different hotspots that can change over time. Of course, uh, China was one initially, then Italy, then the United States. So I would expect that this picture will continue to change as the virus continues to have first, second, third uh, waves in multiple locations. Here's a picture from the United States. This one comes from the New York Times. And this is a, an absolute number of confirmed cases. You can see that there have been a lot in the New York, New Jersey area and really all along this coastline here. You also have areas like Chicago and Michigan hit hard as well as Los Angeles. So some of this may be driven by density as well as the associated connectedness in, the, um, in that community. There also can be differences based on testing. We know that New York has been ramping up testing uh, and there are even testing differences uh, among different states in the Southeast, for example. Uh, so it's difficult to, to know just by looking at cases what's going on, but certainly we've seen a, a number of cases across the US. This is cases over time in the United States. And if you, this is from the CDC. And if you just look at this alone, you'd say, oh, we're doing great. We're on the, the, the downward side of that epi curve. Well, there are a couple of problems with that conclusion. One is that a lot of this is driven by New York. So on the right-hand side, I took out just the state of New York. I, I left in New Jersey, Connecticut, all of the others that have been hard hit. And you can see now that, that it's not really decreasing. And so it really is different in different states. We're at different points in this epidemic. So this picture is showing places that are currently increasing, either because the testing is increasing or because the actual transmission is increasing. California is increasing. We've got North Carolina going up here, Wisconsin going up. Uh, there are others where it's going down. So we're at different points in that, in that epidemic curve, and there may be different policies going on in these different states as well. So let me go back to that question about the second wave for COVID-19. I can tell you a little bit about where I think some of the different states are, uh, and particularly because of this, this idea of herd immunity. So uh, let's look at North, uh, uh, an example here. Let's look at New York City. This is here on the left. No, not New York City, excuse me. New York State is on the left. And on the right, we have North Carolina. And you can see we've got the total confirmed cases and probable total confirmed and probable deaths and total confirmed cases and confirmed and probable deaths on the right hand side. And I, and I do believe that these death counts are accurate. I have looked at excess mortality uh, from a number of different states and in particular the, the numbers in New York are probably an undercount of deaths, whereas the ones in North Carolina are probably a little closer to accurate. So suppose that the true mortality from the disease is somewhere between 0.5% and 1%, and that's what the, the evidence is suggesting. So if that's true, then the deaths below would make the true cases 2.9 million with a 1% mortality or 5.9 million with a 0.5% mortality. Now look at how big those are compared to the actual confirmed cases. Much, much more. So much more widely spread than what you would see just by looking at the confirmed cases. Now I can take this estimate of cases and I can compare it to the overall population. And for the state of New York, that would range between 15 to 30% of the population. This is also consistent with the studies of, of the antibody tests that are being rolled out now. And so is that enough for herd immunity? I would say probably not quite, although New York is the, the closest state to that because they have had the, the most number of infections. And of course, it can be different in New York City than it is in, in other communities in New York. Now let's look at North Carolina over here. The same calculation um, of using the true mortality rate would make our true cases somewhere between 85,000 and 170,000, 170, you know, much bigger. 
Uh, that's not inconsistent with other estimates that say somewhere between five and 10 times the number of actual cases because there, there was not sufficient testing and, and people would sometimes call a doctor and it would say, well, it sounds like COVID, but uh, you, know, you don't really need to come for a test because it's not going to change the, the treatment for you. So um, the, the actual number of cases probably much higher. However, if you look at that on a population level, that translates to a pretty small percentage of the population. So on the, one, on the one hand, that's good because it means that North Carolina has uh, had a lower effective R0 and the spread of the virus has been slower here. But on the other hand, we're not close to that, that herd immunity yet. So I'm, I'm really expecting that, that some states are further along in that epi curve than other states. And so do I expect a second, a second wave? The answer is yes. I don't think that we're there yet in, in North Carolina, throughout the Southeast, and actually most of the country. So I am expecting more cases. So this is the COVID model for Georgia. Uh, and this one, uh, as I mentioned before, took the influenza model and adapted it to COVID-19. This is not a paper by me. My colleagues did this, uh, specifically my Georgia Tech colleagues uh, like Pinar Kiskinajek and Nicoletta Serban and their students and postdocs. And you can see the forecast for Georgia. Here's the, the really, this is corresponding to the first uh, sets of cases. And then after this, it's really a forecast. And these are three different scenarios with different uh, voluntary quarantining um, adoptions. And you can see that, that for Georgia, they're predicting there is a significant second peak that's coming uh, sometime in the summer, June, July, August. Uh, so that's one example. Of course, this can be extended to other states. Uh, it takes some time and effort to do so uh, and to, to calibrate the parameters and, and get it in the, right, uh, in the right state and really validate that. And it's easier for states that don't have quite as much connectivity, like New York would be harder because of the significant connectivity across, uh, you know, across that part of the country. Um, but places like Georgia and North Carolina are a little bit easier for that. Now I will uh, wrap up and then go to any questions that we have. So as you've seen today, disease models are, are often based on sophisticated mathematics using differential equations and other kinds of things and high performance computing. So the examples that I've shown you with influenza and others, uh, we're, we're doing multiple iterations. And so it, it takes quite a lot of computing to get enough iterations to get some uh, to, to drive down the uncertainty and be able to make some conclusions. We know in general that forecasts are always wrong. You're always predicting the future and you're never going to be perfectly right. Yet uh, a lot of times these insights can be helpful uh, in, in thinking about the, the problem, thinking about the process, thinking about the possibilities of, of what there is to come. I, I always tell you know, my students and others to always challenge assumptions and the input data Garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, if, you, if you're not putting in good information, you're not going to get out good information, and you need to continuously revise and, and update as you learn more information. But I think it also shows that engineers can help solve public health problems too. And over a decade of time, my colleagues and I and others have been involved in helping to plan and thinking about things like food distribution and vaccine distribution and other kinds of things. And so these are things that industrial engineers and, and others um, can, uh, can work on too. So now let's turn to any questions and please continue to, uh, to add the questions as we go. And I'll take some of the ones that, that I can uh, easily see, and so they won't necessarily be in the same order as they're written. So here's one here that says, do we use commercially available simulation software? Did we develop it ourselves? We developed it ourselves. We're not using commercial software. Um, I, I believe it was uh, C or C++ that the influenza model was, was built on initially. We are doing some distributed runs now uh, in a high performance computing environment, but it is still work that we've done ourselves. Okay, there's a question about what time frame would we expect a second wave? Would China, Italy see the second wave before the US since they had initial outbreaks before the US? So we are starting to see second waves, uh, for example, in South Korea uh, and, and others. They really depend quite a lot on what policies are in place. Um, 
you know, if you look at um, like Australia and New Zealand are in a very different situation. They are islands. They can restrict the travel to those locations. They can, they can really make sure that people are quarantining when they're coming into that country. So I'm expecting that they may not necessarily have a second wave like some of the other places. Um, in Europe, there are some places where they're starting to go back to school. So I, I do think that that is going to start to lead to more uh, cases than we had before. The, uh, some of the countries are, are able to put in place testing and tracing, and so that can reduce the impact of second waves and, and um, dampen it down because they're catching cases early and then quarantining people. This does mean that the virus is going to spread out over a longer time period, but everyone is looking for ways to do that in ways that are safest for the population. Uh, so time frame for expect a second wave, um, certainly anytime a distancing policy is relaxed, I start looking for cases to increase about three weeks afterwards, you know, two weeks for some of those infections to occur, or another week for them to really start, start hitting the numbers. Uh, and that is also true of, of things like Memorial Day uh, or Fourth of July. So you look at this change in mixing patterns and change in contact patterns, and I would expect to see uh, a wave, uh, the beginnings of a wave two to three weeks later. It does also depend on how people respond. The more people who choose to voluntary quarantine when that happens, the more delayed that second wave can be. Now let me turn to um, uh, some other questions that we that we have. I am going to make slides available publicly afterwards. Um, let's see, the other types of simulation models that, that have been used or could be used. So that's a great question. There's a lot of different kinds of simulation models. There's discrete events, so that one might be appropriate for using in modeling hospital operations. Uh, Monte Carlo system dynamics. Sometimes system dynamics are uh, deterministic, uh, modeled with differential equations. So, so the SEIR model could fit into that, or it could be a simpler form of a of a network type of model. Um, I don't know specifically each. In, I mean, there are more than two thousand papers published on COVID nineteen so far. So, I don't have a specific example of each one of these, um, but I, I I do know some of them uh, and uh, some of the most well-known modelers in the world. There's a group at Imperial College and I think that they are using an agent-based type of model. Um, there's another group um, out of Harvard that had a, a paper that appeared not very long ago. I'm not sure that it was an agent-based. It might have been more like a Monte Carlo um, type of approach. So I'd have to go back and, and check that and I could provide that, that resource um, uh, to others as well. Okay, uh, let's see, another, another question here. What might be the impact of second wave on small fall semester within colleges across North Carolina? And this question goes well beyond North Carolina. This goes really to a lot of colleges all across the United States. Anytime we're making any of these forecasts, they are dependent on many, many things that can change over time. Uh, you know, we can have better treatments, and so that changes things. We can uh, put in place distancing policies and, and add to those. Right now, there's not a really good sense of what is happening as states are, are lifting their, their restrictions, but still keeping in place some restrictions, like some restrictions on how many patrons can be in a restaurant, or restrictions on how a hair salon might operate. Um, you can also see as different places of worship are, are using different approaches to this, uh, you can see differences. Um, you know, the more that we can find ways to reduce the transmission through things like, you know, reducing respiratory transmission through face coverings, then the slower that pandemic might roll out. So for me, I look for what are the ways that, that my family and I can come to a new normal where we can protect ourselves as well as protect others, um, but still find a way to go about um, living life. Because of course, there, there are many things that you, you need to do to, to do that. And we take risks every day. I, you know, I drive my car on a regular basis and that's also a risk. So I'm trying to balance those risks and I might balance them differently than someone else in my family who has a different set of risk factors and a, and a different uh, set of needs. 
Um, certainly universities are looking at many, many ways to protect students as well as protecting faculty and staff and the community. Uh, distancing, uh, PPE, uh, different ways of operating classes and dorms and food centers and, and everything else. So we are continuing to look at that, as I'm sure the public school systems are as well. Okay, let's see, um, is, are there any individual decision making of the agents? Right now, the agents are allowed to make decisions on whether to voluntary quarantine or not. Right now, it's more of a random decision rather than based on who they are. Uh, but there are some different uh, aspects that may be different for different individuals. Other than input data and parameters, are there significant difference between the models our study used for influenza and COVID-19? So it's primarily disease parameters, but there are a lot of disease parameters. So it's the time period from uh, exposure to infection. It's the, uh, the proportion who are asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, hospitalized, uh, recover, it's the age-based transmission, it's the level of transmission that occurs in households, workplaces, or community settings. Uh, there's, there are really a lot of different parameters that do go into it. There is a, a website where people are collecting and putting parameters, so a paper will be published that might have implications for the duration of the infectious period, and that would go into that website. And so that's available for researchers and, and you yourselves to look at if you like. Uh, and then of course, we look at what other modelers do as well. Uh, certainly those modelers that I mentioned before that are well known as well as others. And so we compare across that. Now, new data does come out every day. Uh, you know, the first, when this uh, virus arose in China, it looked like the fatality rate was higher than we think it is now. Um, but it does, it, it does still seem to be much more um, uh, fatal than, than influenza, for example. And that's also supported by the fact that <clears throat> we've had more deaths from COVID-19 in the United States than we would typically have from influenza in a year. Uh, and we're, we're still going, we're not done yet. Um, but there, the primary difference is a number of different parameters. Now, if you talk about influenza and coronaviruses, they tend to spread in the same way with the airborne transmission and possibly surfaces. Compare that with something like cholera, which is waterborne, and there were examples in Haiti where the virus uh, was in the water uh, upstream and then travel downstream, that might require a different type of model than the one we're using for influenza and coronavirus. So it's, it's most appropriate, I think, for ones that are uh, communicable in similar ways. You know, hepatitis uh, and bloodborne would also be a different kind. Uh, we probably could find ways to adapt it, but it might be better to use a different, kind, a different structure of the model for those diseases. Uh, have we tested different infectious periods or percentage of asymptomatic patients? <clears throat> we do not have any results on the COVID right now, testing out those different values. We did a little bit of that, uh, not me, but my colleagues at Georgia Tech did a little bit of that on the calibration and, and validation side, uh, but we didn't spend as much time on that. But what we have, I think, done on the calibration side is spent more time on how many uh, transmissions are occurring in the community settings versus in other settings and also taking into account mobility data and what people are doing at different points in time and how much they are moving around in the community because that's going to impact the likelihood of a community transmission versus not if everybody stayed in their homes all of the time right you wouldn't have any community transmission but you can't you can't do that one can't live like that so that's some of the uh, the things that uh, that we've tested out so far. And you know, it, it's not necessarily a quick thing to, to make a particular kind of test. You know, we come up with research questions and we decide how we want to spend our resources because we may spend uh, several months on a particular research question. So I, I thought of one this morning that I think will take a, you know, a couple months to, to really work through all of the details, including gathering the parameters, working through the simulation, writing up the results. And you want to do it as fast as you can to get the results out for decision makers, but you also want to make sure that you're doing a good job at it. Okay, do we have uncertainty due to weather events and temperature? We do not currently have uncertainty due to weather and temperature. Uh, 
And right now we're not using a big seasonality factor for, uh, for the virus that causes COVID-19. We have previously had models that did account for seasonality where that was an understood factor for influenza. And we certainly could do tests of what it would hypothetically look like if uh, COVID-19 did reduce a lot during the summer. And that would likely lead to uh, bigger differences between what happens in the summer and what happens next fall and winter. Um, of course, as others have mentioned, uh, influenza will be circulating at the same time, typically in the fall and winter. And so that can make the, um, the, the surge uh, demand for critical resources pretty important. We are, uh, I'll take this final question and then I'll wrap up. Um, can we elaborate on how transportation is included in the model? Uh, great question. Uh, so what we have is not the mode of transportation per se, but we have uh, travel data that we've gotten from US government uh, sources that allows us to account for things like uh, commuting for workforce. Uh, so, uh, you know, between Raleigh and Chapel Hill, for example, or between other locations, but it also has some additional transportation. So for example, for North Carolina, I think that there is some transportation that occurs back and forth between places like Raleigh and, and Durham and the coastal areas for people who may spend time uh, in that part of the state. And the same can happen, uh, you know, going to the mountains for example. And so the, the model for North Carolina and, and Georgia, of course, would, would take care of some of both of those kinds. What it doesn't have directly is whether that transportation is public transport or other kinds of transport. Uh, over time, if we find that's important for a particular community or state, then we, then we could add that, but it would require uh, some additional investment. So I want to thank you for, for joining today and staying so engaged. We loved all of your questions. I'll see if there are any others that, that I can try to answer later offline. Um, but we really are, are glad that you joined us and uh, consider coming back for a future webinar. We do have some others planned for the future. So we'd love to see you back. Thank you very much. <laughs>